Hi, I'm Sam Vokes at Wickham Wanderers, and you're listening to Wickham Sound. The Wickham Wanderers Show. Welcome to the latest edition of the Wickham Wanderers Show. In the next hour, we'll hear from manager Gareth Ainsworth as he reflects on 10 years in charge at the club. Uh, we'll also look ahead to the trip to Sheffield Wednesday. We'll look back on the defeats against Derby in the league and also, of course, Stephen and Jimmy Papa John's trophy. We'll give you our match debrief with Phil. Uh, thanks to the Wickham Wanderers Ex Players Association, we'll catch up with Julian Laley, who was a midfielder uh, at the club in the uh, late 60s, early 70s. We'll uh, uh, bring you some news from Wickham Wanderers women, some uh, historic news, and also uh, reflect on how the under 18s are doing uh, as they enter a new division. We'll catch up with uh, Christian Price, uh, who's their boss. I think that's it. There might be other stuff too. Yeah, I'm sure there'll be other stuff too. Uh, we caught up with uh, Phil a little earlier on, though, uh, at the club. Uh, Phil Catchpole, I'm sure you don't need uh, introducing us to who he is. Uh, the uh, match commentator, also head of audio and broadcast and uh, host of the fantastic Ring in the Blues podcast. Uh, we spoke to him a little earlier on this afternoon. It was uh, actually at, in the grounds of Adams Park. Outside is what I'm trying to say, very badly. And um, if you're of a nervous disposition, I should suggest that you listen out for uh, the... Um, infamous bird scarer in case it puts in an appearance or two uh, but, <laughs> or maybe more you've been warned uh, but first uh, Phil uh, talks us through uh, the last seven days yeah um, you know a great stadium to go to uh, a really fiery game as well and a brilliant start that first sort of 26 27 minutes looked fantastic for Wickham Wanderers um, one nil up managed for Messi doing the magic again with his fifth goal of the season um, but Derby looked all over the place in that initial start to that game. Um, and then all of a sudden, they had a shot on target, I think, on 26 minutes. And it clicked them into gear. And Wickham really had to defend um, quite a lot in the last 20 minutes or so of that first half. And defended really, really well. Um, but then the second half really just continued in the same pattern. And Derby were really kind of clicking up front. Their fans were saying, That's the there we go. <laughs> the bird scare again. Uh, the Derby fans, oh, twice. Uh, and the Derby, the Derby fans are saying, third time's a charm. The Derby fans are saying, it's the, uh, wow, four times. <laughs> The Derby fans are saying, uh, finally, uh, that that's the first time they've managed to do that this season. Um, and I think we can be a bit lucky in that respect. Uh, although they, they put the low block in. But with Derby, with Conor Hurahane on the pitch, he's got a fantastic record of scoring goals from outside the penalty area. And it was one of those long-range shots that brought them level. Uh, and when you look back on the replay of the second goal, it was an unlucky deflection, although Wickham were incredibly deep. The ball ricocheted off Taff as on his hip and fell to Hurahane once more in the box. Uh, he made no mistake. So, yeah, Wickham were hanging on. Max Strick played some, uh, made some great saves in there as well. But I guess over the 90 minutes and the pattern of play, you can't begrudge Derby to win. On another day, maybe we can come away with a point. Uh, and it's going to be another tough trip to Sheffield Wednesday on Saturday. But, I mean, then after the Derby game, obviously the, the Stevenage Papa John's game and a 3 0 defeat on what was a pretty miserable evening uh, in terms of covering the game because, um, yeah, the young players out there with a few senior players dotted around as well, it was a disjointed performance. Wickham was second best pretty much all over the pitch. Uh, and, uh, and Stevenage, I think, would deserve the win. And we spoke about the excitement before the game, saying wouldn't it be great if these young players could make a claim uh, for the first team on Saturday? And unfortunately, uh, Gareth Ainsworth was didn't have many decisions to make after the uh, after the Papa John's game in midweek. And here's what he had to say after the game: Not like us, you know. We we got out physical today. We didn't win enough headers. A mixture of uh, of a couple of the uh, first team boys who've been in and around it. And Volksy started, you know, and, and Daryl has played a lot. JJ in there. Uh, mixed with some of the development boys and I thought that um, there was lessons learned tonight that um, don't be down, don't be gutted that we lost I want it to hurt and I want to know why it hurt because we didn't win enough headers we didn't win in our tackles uh, they stepped on us and ran harder than us it looked like they were quicker at times and, and more physical and and I think to have careers in the game you've got to learn this, you've got to learn it quick and that's what these games are about great for these development boys you know, to come and see that because um these are League Two players. A lot of them have been in League One, a couple in the Championship. You know, and they know what it's about to have a career in the game. You know, you can have a, you can earn good money in football and have good careers in the game, but you've got to do the basics. You know, winning headers is so important, so important. You know, out physical at this level, you, you you can't not win your headers. You can't 
not be strong enough and, and not track your runners and things like that and and I think we uh, we learned a few lessons tonight which is really important you know gutted we lost because I, I want to win every game but you know with all the development squad coming through now um, some lessons were learned and I think that we'll uh, we'll be positive in the long run for that Sully Kaka getting his first start um, you know and, and we're trying to get Sully up to speed as quick as we can Sam Volk's getting more minutes big positive and, and JJ obviously is you know brilliant to, to, to see him uh, you know playing the way he did but you know, I thought it was positive well, Ali made a good impact when he came on uh, but positives were, were few and far between tonight and uh, I think we've got to we've got to look at that one and think right you know what does it take to be a footballer what do I need to do to have a career and I think we'll be watching that to uh, to show the boys exactly what it takes Defensively was it the individual levers that cost or the fact that it's it's a team that don't have the luxury of playing with each other too often at all and maybe did that contribute as well or? Listen, you can you can point at, at individual things you know you could put the goal on and pick all the bones out of the goal but it felt like they were more powerful than us tonight you know at times and, and that's not good that's not right you know and, and I think you've got to make sure you're up to speed to play in the football league if that's what you want to do and um, I think one or two would probably have their eyes open tonight and thinking right I know what I need to do now and that's uh, it's physical it's, it's committed and, and these league two teams are, they're going to put it on you and step on you you know we know that so fair play to Stevenage they've had a real good go at us um, they're a strong side I think they'll be up in there around it at the end of the season and I think that showed why tonight you know they they deserve the win uh, Peterborough as we're speaking are, are beating Tottenham Hotspur under 21s so it does mean that the final group game is essentially a knockout one win it and Wickham can go through I want to win it I want to go through um, I know uh, I know Rob and, and Pete and Missy will want to go through as well you know they're, they're they want us to win all the games. They, there's money on this. There's, you know, there's there's more competitive games week in week out if you do it right. And I, and I think that we've got to make sure that we uh, we're focused on that when it comes round. But my only focus now is the next four or five games, which are big, big games in this league. You know, and uh, I think you know you look at the fixtures coming up. We've got to be on it. We've got to be really on it. We've got to be uh, performing at our best away at Sheffield Wednesday on Saturday, and then you know we've got to make sure that. Um, the upcoming games were solid we can hurt teams we were on a good platform at least so when all my injured players do come back and suspended players you know we can make an impact in this league that's what we want to do there's, there's big there's big rewards if you can get in that championship and uh, that's why teams are spending so much money to get there we, are, we can't match that top money in the top level but the unbuyables that we, we match sometimes are really important and uh, everyone knows what I'm talking about there we've got to make sure that the things you can't buy we bring to the table week in week out and um, and we'll perform in this league this season really great to hear from him uh, saying obviously that he hopes the players learn from it and you know take something from that experience and him saying that he, he hopes that it hurts and I guess to, to fans as well it might it might come across that you know that they didn't didn't seem to want to to get anything from the game I think it's really difficult I mean these players are development players for a reason they're, they're here to develop and learn and let's not forget this development squad has produced Alex Fometti and Chris Farino. And Chris at stages in League One last season and at times this season has looked a great, a great defender and I will be a great defender who's going to have a glittering career without a doubt. Um, so it's all part of the learning curve. I remember Chris playing in this co- in the Papa John's last season in a 5-0 defeat at home to Burton Albion where Aaron Holloway scored a, a hat-trick. Um, and these nights, these experiences are what makes the players you know, it's the ones that learn from these things and, and kick on and use it to their advantage later down the line. They're the ones who will really reap the rewards as a footballer and hopefully do it in, in the quarter shirts uh, further down the line. But yeah, it's um, you know, it's just, it's a it's a stiff learning curve and they're doing it in the under the uh, sharp light of competitive football with fans watching. Um, and again, I think that's what makes the competitive environment all the more better for these players to learn in. And yeah, hopefully in a year's time, we'll be talking about players who played in that game in a really positive light in the first team, like we are with Chris and, and like we have done with Anis in the past. And great to see some of the first team players getting the game time that they need, which will, which will be good, you know, taking them into, into the upcoming games. Absolutely. I thought Daryl Horgan, Joe Jacobson and Sam Vokes, you know, it's good to have them out there on the pitch. Uh, Sam Vokes, 45 minutes to get more minutes into his legs on the way back from injury. And hopefully that will make him that much more match sharp now when we go into that tough game 
at Hillsborough on Saturday against Sheffield Wednesday. Um, it's just really nice to see Wickham able to use the competition in the way that it was designed for, I think. It's to, to test young to younger players, but also to blend in the experienced players who need that game time too. And as you say, a really great opportunity on Saturday to hopefully bounce back from from that defeat up at Derby and take you know positives from that and, and, and a fantastic kind of place and club to go up against as well. Brilliant. Well, I mean, what, what a game this is. Hillsborough is a brilliant stadium. It's going to be well over 20,000 there on Saturday. Um, they're doing well. I mean, they, haven't, they haven't quite clicked clicked into gear themselves um, chatting to one of their podcasts in the week they were sort of saying yeah we haven't really got going yet they're fourth in the table 19 points uh, I think it is already um, or perhaps more than that um, and that's quite fearful when you think oh they haven't quite clicked into gear yet um, Michael Smith the striker has been injured he's scored two in two starts he'll be a real danger and let's not forget who's in goal David Stockdale as well and he's going to want to make sure Wickham uh, have got a, a shutout as well um, because you know he's he's missed the clean sheets. He's already got five clean sheets up there already, um, and what a good signing he's been for them. Michael Heckway at centre back, Michael Smith we've just mentioned, Barry Bannon in the midfield. The spine of the team's really long. But here's a stat, a positive stat that I learned this week. Every time they've conceded a goal, they haven't won a game this season. So um, if Wickham can score, if Anis Vermetti, for example, can do a bit of magic and stick one past his old mate Stocko, then the stats look good for us. Well, hopefully that will come true. It's a very good stat. I like that. I can t- we can take that into into the game. And also, of course, uh, fantastic that. Yeah, I think the fans, don't they? they they're they always like half empty or half full. But uh, I think things don't look too bad at the moment. Only three points off the playoffs currently. Well, this is, a, this is it. With this stage of the season, um, normally after 10 games, um, you kind of know where everyone's at in the table. It's an incredibly tight table. It's not like last season. It's not a split division yet. Um, you know, things may happen. Clubs may have bad and good runs and it may become divided later down the line. But this is a very open division. And I would say a bit like last season, there's probably around the 12 team mark who think that they've probably got a really good opportunity to get in the top six come the end of the season. And Wickham will count themselves very much in that shake-up. Um, and they need, need to get over these injury issues, uh, get a consistent team out there. And hopefully, hopefully, uh, put a good run of form together and get themselves in the shake-up because they've still got the reputation of last year. Chatting to Sheffield Wednesday fans, they're a little fearful of the game on Saturday at Hillsborough because of what happened last year. A 2-2 draw at their place, a 1-0 win to Wickham at Adams Park in April. Uh, so there is still the fear factor around Wickham Wanderers and hopefully if the form can pick up and, uh, and teams can, can continue to fear Wickham based on this season's results. And a really nice bit of history as well, being the 135th anniversary since the first game. Yeah, fantastic, isn't it? And what a story that's been. Uh, the, the vast majority of these of the history of the club has been in non-league and amateur football. And to think that we're now going to Sheffield Wednesday on a level footing uh, at Hillsborough is just phenomenal. Oh, th- those guys in the chair factory all that time ago who, who started the team, uh, I think it was the old steam engine pub they did it in up near um, London Road all that time ago. Uh, If you'd have told those boys then what would be happening today, 135 years later, they'd probably be astounded. But what a story. Uh, And hopefully uh, the club can can reach even higher heights. Absolutely. And really nice, obviously, the milestone for the manager as well. Uh, Ten years. I think only one manager in the EFL has has been at a club longer. That's the Harrogate Town manager, isn't it? uh, A great achievement. And as we'll hear from him, you know, so great that, you know, both club and and he himself have, have sort of formed this great partnership. Yeah, it's been brilliant. And it's been brilliant to see Gareth getting a lot of media attention today up at the training ground. We've had Sky, TalkSport, uh, the EFL have been down as well. And there's going to be a lot of content going around this 10 years because it is a really sort of newsworthy thing to happen because you've only got to look at what's going on in, in, in and around the Premier League Championship and even League One today. You know, Leroy was senior. Uh, sorry, Liam Rossini uh, has been relieved of his duties as interim manager at Derby and they've got Paul Warning from Championship Rotherham. Um, so it just shows you that there is no real loyalty in management uh, in both ways. Uh, so, and I understand that it's a cutthroat business. So to have a, a manager at one club for 10 years uh, is phenomenal. And to reach that milestone at Wickham and what a job he's done, what a legacy he's left. It's been a lovely day to reflect on where we've come. We've talked about the first game at Dagenham back in end of September 2012. Uh, to where we are today. And it's a million miles away in every respect. Um, And there's been some dark times. There's been some incredible highs as well. 
and there's been some great laughs on the journey as well and some amazing memorable games along the way and uh, yeah it's been a, a fantastic legacy and long may it continue I mean, there's so much that stands out, isn't there? You know, as you say, the national media like to focus on his sort of rock star image and, and, and just how, how little Wickham have come up to the championship and things like that. But I think something that really else also stands out is that is the culture that he's built. And, you know, you have to have time to be able to be able to do that at a club. And, and that's something that you've seen, obviously, at close quarters as well. Yeah, it's been brilliant to see that because we were chatting to Alfie Mawson earlier um, to find out how he's getting on now um, since he's re-signed for the club. And then we started talking about Gareth Ainsworth because... You know, I said when 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 the phone went and and they talked about him coming back. You know, he didn't think twice about it because he absolutely loved his first spell here, and he said, "Look, Gareth Ainsworth is is a huge reason, and, and Richard Dobson and the other coaches as well." He says Gareth Ainsworth and the culture he's created amongst his coaching staff and the players and all of the staff was a huge huge draw for him. And this is a guy that's played in the Premier League. Um, to hear him talking about Gareth in those in those tones was was really nice to hear. And it was a really good sort of insight into into why so many players come back to this club. Uh, and the players that do come as well for the first time, they were still here. They're coming on the fact that it's a small world football and they'll know what 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 goes on here at Wickham. And, and it's it's attractive for players. And the man management of him as well, I think, the way he treats his players, uh, they can tell how much they respect him. Uh, and it, it's been great to see that culture at close hand. And and Dobbo made a really good point earlier as well, is that that takes time to sort of engender around a club. And that's the time they've been given. And not everyone gets that time. And it's been brilliant that Wickham and Gareth have got this, this partnership now that, that's going well into its 10th year. And so many fans grateful to have him and, and appreciative of, of you know, where, where he's got the club to as well. And he has obviously a fantastic relationship with the supporters as well. Yeah, I've often said that I think Gareth is, is one of the few managers I've ever spoken to in football that really kind of understands what it means to be a fan, to be on the terrace, to be in the stands. Um, because he, he did that initially with his dad, with Blackburn. Uh, there was a great flirt with him the other week when Blackburn were away at Reading and he's in the away end with his son because Wickham didn't have a game that night. Uh, and he's there as a fan. And I think it's important that he's been able to keep that tie because you know it's the fans that really are the heartbeat of all of football. They're the ones who pay the money to come through the turnstile. Without the fans, there wouldn't be a game. Uh, we know what it's like without them now because of the COVID crisis, um, and I think Gareth really appreciates the fans. And and you know, let's not let's not beat around the bush here as well. He's had some stick off those fans as well down the years, especially at the start. Um, but he understands it, I think, and I think he realises that he's got a responsibility as a manager, the leader of the club. Uh, but he took over the time when it was quite fractious here, and he brought the whole club together, and, and the fans were included in that. Uh, so it's good to see that his relationship with the fans is is, is stronger than ever. And he has a real impact on the community as well. A patron of One Can Trust, he sings in the high street when required, or maybe even not even when required. He might just happily do that anyway. Uh, he's got his name on a bus. Um, you know, it's just uh, he gets pictures taken with fans at four in the morning in fast food takeaways. It's re- a real kind of like fans' favourite. Yeah, you know, I think a cult hero. At every club he's been at, and, and Wickham as well is, in, you know, he's more than a cult hero. He's a legend. Um, but like you say. People wouldn't do those things, naming buses and all the other bits. That wouldn't happen if he wasn't a great guy as well. Um, and I think it just speaks volumes for him, the love for him in the community. Um, and he knows, again, where this football club is at in the community, the importance of football clubs in the community. And he leads one and he leads it fantastically. Well, hopefully he'll be here for another 10 years as well. Hopefully, yeah, that would be wonderful, wouldn't it? I mean, his hair will still be the same colour. <laughs> Pleasure to speak to you. Thank you very much for your time. Cheers, Colin. More from Phil next week. And, of course, he'll bring us full match commentary on Saturday from Hillsborough as well. And a reminder, you can hear uh, his chat with Gareth and others uh, in full on Wanderers TV. Online, on Radio Player and on 106.6 FM. This is Wickham Sound. Still to come on this week's edition of the Wickham Wanderers show, some exciting news around Wickham Wanderers women uh, and uh, also Adams Park. It was announced this week playing host once again to Wickham Homeless Connections. Big sleep out on Saturday the 26th of November, raising urgently needed funds for the homeless across South Bucks. Uh, Heather Stanley from the charity will be joining us on Mid Mornings tomorrow. Uh, if you're listening to the podcast version, that's Mid Mornings on the 23rd of September. It was a Friday. <laughs> Uh, meantime, though, uh, thanks to Wickham Wanderers Ex Players Association, uh, we'll catch up with uh, another uh, former star uh, who was uh, in the midfield some uh, 50 years ago uh, for Wanderers at Lokes Park. But his uh, affiliation with Wickham Wanderers came uh, quite a bit before that. Uh, let's catch up now uh, with the thoughts and memories of Julian Laley. 
Wickham's in, in my blood, as it were. Um, I've always been Wickham because I was born, what, about, I don't know, 200 yards from Lokes Park, as was. I was born in Richardson Street, and I went to school. The school then was in the town, I think it's, it's called John Hampton School now. It was the Wickham Technical High School then, opposite the Rye. I did live in Marlow. So, uh, yes, I've always been a Wickhamite, if you like. And does that make it extra special, playing for your hometown club? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, my early memories was I was taken there with my, my uncle, who, again, lived not far away from Richardson Street, you know, within, what, shouting distance of Lokes Park. And uh, they, he and uh, his other brother, uh, we uh, every, every home match, I'm talking about me being about nine, ten, went to Lokes Park for every home match. Um, I remember seeing Wickham play a Nigerian side, I think it was, uh, who came over, one of the early African teams. And most of them played without boots, in bare feet. I remember going up to Highbury to watch Wickham play Walmsdow Avenue in the FA Amateur Cup semi-final, the old Highbury. Um, they beat Walmsdow 4-2. Um, and then they went on to play Bishop Auckland at Wembley, where unfortunately they lost three one. I didn't go to Wembley. I couldn't afford the ticket or the or was a train ride then. So I've uh, yeah, I've always been associated with Wickham. I played played my football subsequent to Wickham um, longer years with Cheltenham Town because I went to Cheltenham to teach and I spent longer there. But but no, Wickham's always been my club. It's always in my heart. And uh, it ever will be, yeah. It's, uh, I'm a Wickham, uh, a, a Wickham boy, born and bred. And what were they like to watch in the early days? Oh, yeah, oh, good. Um, they've always had um, a decent team. You, you know, at, at, at their level, they've, they've always been challenging. In the early days, I can remember, I mean, the real hero, I saw and remember them very, very well. You had Len Worley, who's always been my idol, probably... Probably the best player I've ever played with, then, because I I caught him. I played started playing for Wickham when he was in his twilight, and uh, he was still sort of fantastic uh, player. Always played, or well, the managers always played, Len on the top of the slope. To a half time, he'd switch wings just to play on the on the top of the slope. But he was, yeah, he was a Stanley Matthews of his day, wasn't he? No, absolutely. And of course, being a midfielder yourself, you must have been, you know, obviously quite close to him in, in many ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was generally on the, uh, the other side. I was always a left footer. And like all left footers, I didn't have much of a right foot. So I, you, <laughs> I was often down, down the bottom end. Uh, he played on the right wing. Uh, except, you know, when we, we changed, changed over at half time. So that, then I, yeah, I, I played with him. But a fantastic footballer. But there are others, weren't there then? You, you know, I, I can almost remember um, the team that played in the in the cup final. You know, Sirrett in goal, um, Paul Bates. Paul Bates was a good good centre forward. Typical sort of Bobby Smith of Spurs in his day. Good trot. You, you know, they they were yeah they were the people I I admired and watched as a as a boy. And then obviously to, to get the chance to play for the club, tell us a bit about how how that came about. Uh, well, it was. I suppose it was inevitable, really. I started, my, my parents moved from Wickham. They had a, they had a spell up at Totteridge, but then they moved to Marlow. They're always the Marlow people and moved to, to Marlow. So I, I played for Marlow, but I can remember playing, I, was a, I don't know how this came about, actually. Um, Wickham youth uh, played Arsenal youth in a sort of, I suppose it was a trial match. Um, I'd been 15 and I was, I was asked to sort of guest for the Wickham team, so that that introduced me there. But I, I played at Lokes Park. I played played for um, a school team, Wickham Tech, uh, as I say now, John Hampton. We played cup finals. Remember playing against Hatters Lane? Does Hatters Lane still exist? Absolutely, yes. It, yeah. it, it's called Highcrest now, but yes. Right. Okay. Um, also played. Oh, I played youth team. Uh, although I lived in Marlow, then for Terriers youth side in the. Wickham League, they, they they had a good side, tended to win everything. Up at Hazelmere, that was a good experience. So I've always been, really, been around around Wickham. I think it was inevitable that if I ever 
ever got to that standard that that's where I'd end up. And that must have been fantastic when you kind of arrived, if you like, and started playing with, with some of these great names of that time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and they did have a good time. Good team. When I, when I, when I started to um, start playing uh, with them, they had, they had a good team, always had a good team, as I say. The Eastman League, they were always challenging a bit. But I remember John Maskell, probably the best amateur goalkeeper I ever played with. John Maskell, I think he's still around, isn't he? Yes, absolutely. Oh, you had some, some brilliant players. I mean, Tony Horsman, of course, the um, goal scorer, extraordinary. He was, to me, he was the, the Jimmy Greaves of his day. Uh, Tony would, would, would just be there. He'd just float around the penalty area. Um, he wouldn't work back much. He didn't need to. You know, you knew if, if he had the ball at his feet uh, anywhere within striking distance, it was uh, you know, a good chance he'd end up in the back of the net. Great goal scorer. It must have been such an interesting period because you know when you arrived at the club, there were, as you say, people like Len Worthy who were coming towards the end of their career, and then yeah. up and coming youngsters like Viv Fusby and Vince Faulkner as well. That's right. Yeah, they 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 were both there. Uh, Paul Birdseye, yeah, the youngsters. But but you you know, going to be Brian Lee was the manager. Well, I say I I just joined before Brian came. I remember playing for Wickham. Brian Lee had been appointed. Um, we didn't know at the time, but he he was manager of Telford. And uh, they came to play us in a pre-season friendly. Or was it? Or was it to the back end of the season? I don't know. It was a friendly anyway. None of us knew that Brian had been appointed then, but we played there, and, and Brian then started in uh, the new season. And I remember Brian really as the only a manager I had when I was there, and uh, he gathered together a strong team. I mean, he had um, some, you know, amateur internationals. Uh, there, but people like Ian Rundle as well, great fullback, Jeff Anthony, T. Searle, um, John Delaney, great captain. Oh gosh, I have to go through Larry Pritchard, um, Peter Sudderby. Yeah, you mentioned Peter Sudderby. Um, we both um, played for, for Oxford University, and we both both played in the Blues team when we were at Wickham. And I remember Peter coming. Um, and uh, he was he was a player. He went on to Blackpool, didn't he, as a pro? And I think he ended he ended up a long time as uh, youth team coach at Spurs. We had a reunion, and you know, the Oxford University Blues team. Um, what about ten years ago or something? And at that time, he was um, yeah, he was in charge of the Spurs youth team. I think so. He made a made a good career in football. Very very good player. Very mobile. Him and um, John Delaney, you know, he was the he was the heart of the defence. Uh, tall, strong, no nonsense uh, centre half. And then he had Peter sort of sweeping round behind him, good on the ball, mobile. Uh, they made a very good uh, combination in the in the centre of the defence. Yeah, we had um, yeah a good team. But I think with them, they, they've always in the amateur world. Certainly, they always more than held their own. I remember that yeah, disappointment, I suppose. I had three years, only three years, and it seems, you know, I played for them all my life. But um, those three years were, were great years for me. I can remember probably the biggest disappointment of all was when we had a crowd of nearly 10,000 for the quarterfinal of the FA Amateur Cup. We were favourites because we were playing at home. We had some international, amateur international players. We were playing at St Albans. Northern City, and uh, we'd beaten them, you know, in the league. We were higher than they in the league, and I. But but come the, come the day, great crowd. I think uh, the occasion probably got too much for us. Um, uh, we lost two 0 and they, to be honest, they played us off the park. I think looking back, I I had an awful game, and I, I think you know mentally we probably thought we'd won it before we stepped on the park, which is a. A lesson for everyone. We were always, probably always in the top three. We were, I can remember the, my last season, we were about 10 points ahead of Enfield, but Enfield had six games to go. They, they, they had a backlog for some reason. I can't remember, perhaps they had a good cup run. Or we, we, were, we were way ahead in the league, but they won all their, all their remaining matches and dipped us probably by, by one point, I think. So that was disappointing too. So yeah, I missed out on on um, 
the Isman League. So what would you say were some of your highlights during your time at the club? I enjoyed every every moment of, of every game there. I, I suppose I, I can't remember us losing at, at Lokes Park um, over my three years. We we might have done. We lost in yeah we lost lost in a, the old cup match, but but I can't remember us losing at Lokes Park in a league match um, over that time. We played good football. Um, Brian Lee was was, a, was an excellent manager, and uh, we knocked the ball around. You know there wasn't. Um, um, a case of, of well, let's let's get it upfield as quickly as possible, hoof it up, and let's um, let's see what the forwards can do. Um, it's good constructive football, um, a lot of good ball playing football. I think Brian went uh, went for that sort of player. Um, so I, I think I hope you'd have to ask others, um, but I think we played attractive football. Uh, we certainly scored, seemed to, you know, have, have some. Um, Big scores. Uh, the Isma League was, was uh, in those those days. Um, the top top half a dozen clubs were really good, and um, that's where probably the amateur internationals were drawn from. The, the, the bottom half um, was wasn't uh, as strong. I suppose typical of most leagues. Um, and so we, we we had some sort of big wins, I suppose, against, against those, but some great wins. Oh, well, one of one of the yeah, I suppose I, I, I would recall um, going to Enfield. Enfield always, they were our big rivals. As I say they picked us for the league in, in my last year by a, a point by winger winning their backlog of, of matches. But we went to, I think it was that year, we went to Enfield and uh, really just, just walked right over them. We won 4 0. I can remember. I think John Delaney might have even got, you know, the centre half might have got two coming up from corners. But, you know, you do it occasionally get those games where everything clicks and everyone clicks. And uh, they were never in the game. And the poor nil was, was flattering to them, I think. The only game I'm sure they, 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 they lost um, at home that year. So. And you got to represent England as well. That must have been fantastic. Oh, that was great. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. One of those was Wickham. The reason I left Wickham and, and then played a few international matches at Cheltenham Town was simply because I got my first teaching post there, and so uh, that, that that took me away from Wickham. I did did commute for a little while from Cheltenham um, to Wickham, but in the end, the distance was too much, and so I I, I joined Cheltenham Town, who were you know semi professional Southern League team. I never. Uh, Although they wanted me to, I never, I never changed my amateur status. Um, partly because um, I didn't want a contract, because that that can be very tiring. But I was a teacher, and I, I wanted to carry on playing international football for England, which I, which I continued to do with with Cheltenham. But it was at Wickham really that that I I started when when I got 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 my first cap and. Uh, I go back to what I said at the start. Although I play for other clubs and, and I, I play more times for Cheltenham Town than I did for Wickham, those three years at Wickham were were, were absolute highlight. Um, I probably played my best best football then. Uh, to I was early twenties. I never really left Wickham, if you see what I mean. No, definitely. And speaking to other players as well, ex-players, something that really comes across is how well you all got on as well. Yeah. Oh yeah, the, yeah. I can't remember any arguments at all amongst us, or you know, anyone being ostracised or, or whatever. Training was all, always fun. Brian Lee always made it fun. Um, he varied the, the routines we had for training. Yeah, the camaraderie was was really good. The team always got on very very well. We had team meetings. You know, no one was, um, I suppose, any above anyone else. So everyone sort of treated. Equally, I think give credit to Brian Lee. You know, he he was my manager for the, all those years that, that I was there, and uh, he set the tone. And and you you know, Brian was a manager. He he didn't rant and rave or show any favouritism or, or whatever. We all felt, I'm sure, equals in in that team, and he 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 made it so. The great thing with 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 football and and, and a lot of team games is shared experience. You know, if you win and and win well and people play well, 
you're euphoric and uh, you, you're happy. If he goes the other way and, you know, have a lousy match and, and lose, play badly, you're all down in and do up. But you're all together. And it's that shared experience, I think, that, that makes makes all so special. But also, of course, I think in life, it, it gave us the highs and the lows. You know, and if you can, you, you know, always look forward to Saturday because of the uncertainty. You never know um, whether you're going to win or lose. You don't know whether you're going to play well or, or not. But when 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 you do, and others, there, there's there's nothing like football when you you all play well together, and it's a good match, and you share that joy on the coach going back home if it's an away match, or in the changing room afterwards. Yeah, it's it's a fantastic experience. And as you say, really special to say you've played for your hometown club as well. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's um, it's, it's the one that that uh, I always made. I always look at, at, at Wickham's results first before I look at anyone else's. Um, I still follow football, but obviously from the armchair. I haven't seen them. I mean, that, that, you, that means you've odd, um, because they do come up here. Um, I live about four, five miles from Morecam. You know, I live in Lancaster, and uh, I'm, still, I'm still involved with sport, and uh, my sport also sort of coincides. I, I do um, a lot of pearl running and orienteering, I really took up when when football, you know, got um, got beyond me. Um, then I started orienteering, as sort of uh, not many people know about orienteering, but it's running um, with a map, uh, compass, and so on. And I uh, I represented England. I represented England with orienteering. The, the the thing with football is, but when you can't play at the level that you you used to play at, then um, you do other things. With orienteering, we uh, the competition is is against your peers because you you do a course basically um, with people within your your age range, and so I've kept on doing that and fell running as well. You know, I I do being near the lakes here, which I am. I'm often in the lakes uh, running there, and that that means you know I, I I don't go and see live football matches. The weekends is when when the races are on. So I don't do um, don't do much watching live. I, <laughs> I watch a lot of uh, football on TV, but that, that's it. Former Wickham Wanderers at midfielder Julian Laley speaking to us here at Wickham Sound. Online, on Radio Player and on 106.6 FM, this is Wickham Sound. Still to come on this week's edition of the Wickham Wanderer Show, uh, we'll hear from manager Gareth Ainsworth reflecting on his 10 years in charge at the club. First day, very exciting news for Wickham Wanderers women. It's been announced this afternoon they'll be playing their first ever competitive fixture at Adams Park when they take on Sports London e Benfica ladies in the second qualifying round of the Vitality Women's FA Cup. And that tie is being played at 2 o'clock on Sunday, the 2nd of October. Uh, we'll be building up to that, of course, uh, here on the Wickham Wanderer Show. Uh, we'll be uh, finding out a little more about that fixture as well as we get a bit closer to kickoff as well. Uh, but first, the under-18s have a new league to uh, get involved with this season, and uh, Christian Price is their manager. We've obviously entered into the JPL League. Uh, it's a really challenging league. There's different kind of perception or expectation on the girls this year. So we're all about kind of hanging in the fight and uh, competing, um, but perhaps maybe not necessarily winning our matches. But obviously. Be assured, we'll be going out there and giving it our best shot and looking to kind of take all three points on match day. But um, the competition is, is, is much greater. Um, lots of challenges there. But yeah, it's really exciting. So Ipswich Town this weekend. So in the Cup, so we're really looking forward to it. Can't wait. I was going to say, how much of a step up uh, will it be for, for, for the players? It's a massive step. Carl, uh, head coach Carl, has kind of warned us of such. Um, but the girls have been kind of playing at you know, community club uh, level for a long time and competing and doing really well. And it was just absolutely necessary for us to embark on this next journey, really. And it was right for those girls as well. Maybe they haven't had the opportunities at academies and what have you, but it's, um, it's, it's right up there. Um, so it's a, it's a challenge for both you know, the players and, and the coaching staff, really. Um, but yeah, we're, we're, we played last week, uh, had a two all draw there, a game that we, we were winning. Uh, last kick of the game, they got a penalty, which was really galling. But the girls did really, really well. So, from a, a coaching perspective, it was probably the most improved performance I've ever witnessed from our bunch of girls uh, and probably the best team performance I've ever kind of witnessed as a coach myself over the eight years that I've been with 
the majority of these players. So, yeah, we're making some really, really good strides at the moment. And, um, yeah, it's um, going really well. But, yeah, definitely a step up. Um, but it's something that we're, you know, taking on board and, and relishing. So, yeah, looking forward to more to come. Must be so pleasing for you as well. I had such a su- successful season uh, last season as well. And, and just watching the side develop. Yeah, again, you know, we've we've had we had lots of um lots of uh, successful seasons over the years and I'll be honest with you, you play the matches sometimes and um you kind of do very well and you compete um right throughout the whole season and come the end of the season it becomes uh, almost like a, a relief rather than elation where it's uh you know, we, the expectation is the girls to go out and win, and they've been, they've been doing that week in, week out. Um, and so this is this is another level now, and um, I, I'm sure one that we can fully compete in. So yeah, really, really exciting. But yeah, it's 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 great being a part of these girls um, and being involved so heavily with their development and, um, and 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 watching them develop over the years as kind of uh, as players, but as also as 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 people as individuals and you know the the, the spirit that we've showing this season um it is great we've probably half the squad that we have is has come to us as new this year um and there's a, there's a nice sense of excitement now where the girls are getting to know each other um and that that's what this is all about it's all about those bonds and those girls kind of taking those bonds forward into match day and you know um and putting together and putting on a you know putting on a fantastic uh, team performance and that that was a reflection of what happened last weekend um, and we're looking to kind of build on that week on week you know so um, yeah it's, it's amazing and it must be such a motivator as well for the, the girls to have as a reward the opportunity to progress to the first team yeah again you know that's the whole point of coming over here so we came over a couple of years back so we had that opportunity for the girls that maybe weren't maybe being stretched enough on, on a Saturday to have the opportunity of really kind of coming up some uh, against the you know, very, very experienced footballers which will in turn bring on their uh, their footballing uh, skill and profile and knowledge and everything else so um, it, it's great having that opportunity there to fall back into that as well and that will obviously help Carl's promotion push there for for the girls this year and, and you know they they've obviously didn't play at the weekend but they've started really well they won their first game of the season so um, hopefully it's first of many and um, we can all you know pull it forward all in the right direction and, and, and get those guys where they want to be for next season too so yeah it's um it, it's a, a fantastic setup there the coaches are working really hard continuously hard um, on on whatsapp chats and all of that kind of stuff just to kind of coordinate training sessions but yeah everything's everything's well planned for lots of time and, and investment our own time and investment goes into this and um, it's hugely rewarding so yeah great to be part of and it feels like a really exciting time at the club as well as we've mentioned with the first team and Carl coming in and uh, the changes that he's brought in obviously the reserve team and and the the under 18s as well a really sort of successful unit if you like yeah and again that's what it's all about right so it's all about us kind of working together as a collective and and, you know putting putting squads out that is a a benefit to all of the sides and it isn't just about Carl's side it's uh, Jamie's team in the reserves as well and it's um it's just really important that we kind of have that set up right. And um, as coaches, we have to lead by example and we have to make sure that those, um, that process uh, and that foundation is in place. And if we, if we can get that right, then we're halfway there, really. But, you know, we're under no illusions. We've still got lots of work to do. We've still got to kind of pull all three squads, which are pretty much a new bunch of girls together. Um, but, yeah, match days um, and, and, you know, training nights twice weekly, it's a really, it's a really good vibe. It's, it's great to be part of. And um, it's just like, a, you know, a celebration of women's footy, really. And, um, yeah, again, love, lovely being involved in it, really. And, you know, playing, a, hopefully, what is a, a, you know, a big part in that, too. So, yeah, love it. And as a coach, have you noticed a real uh, upsurge in interest, obviously, since, since what England have done at the Euros as well? Yeah, I, I, I think so. Um, I, I think so. I think um, I, I think that um, the under 18s uh, certainly um, by them going into the JPL, I think that's definitely created some interest there. Um, I also think certainly from a, an investment perspective, um, that's been absolutely key. So I think there's a lot of people now that probably were thinking about maybe getting involved in the women's game, but obviously since the the Lionesses' amazing success over the Euros, I think that's definitely kind of catapulted that ambition and you know a lot of uh, local businesses has, has welcomed that opportunity to be involved in that and whether they are um, you know existing sponsors that come back for another shot or whether they're new guys um, yeah we, we've done really well on that front so um, yeah all, all of that is you know really helpful um, you know and it's been well documented it's a shame that it hasn't come 
um, come into our into our laps a lot earlier. But you know, we'll, we'll take every little bit of help that we can get, and um, yeah, very much appreciated and needed, of course. So um, yeah, it's been it's been very helpful. And I know when Carl first took over, he said he got asked a lot um, about what all his targets were and what he hoped to achieve. And um, do you sort of set targets in, with the under 18s as well? Uh, no, not not really, not really. I think it, for me, it's about making sure that we have the right environment um, in the 18s. Uh, it's a kind of a, a nurturing environment. We um, we're not really about necessarily winning all of our matches. Of course, we want to win all of our matches, but it's really about kind of developing the girls uh, as as people. Uh, first and foremost, and then players too. Uh, and if we get that right, we're you know we're halfway there. So we, we've probably got perhaps maybe a kind of a, a different sort of alignment there. But um, certainly um, that that that's what I'm really looking at. We're looking to kind of go into this JPL. Don't really know what to expect, but we do know that we've got you know, Millwall and, and Fulham and, and Watford. Notts County, Notts Forest, Ipswich Town this weekend. So big brands that are coming to us and it's just really amazing to be part of that and certainly from my perspective, you know, the, the days of going down the road to take on, you know, Maidenhead and Twyford and Wargrave and what have you to now kind of these these fixtures that we're facing it, it's 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 the right move it's been it's right for these girls these girls have kind of are ready for these challenges now and um we go to hit out on those every single saturday and really you know, really look to compete and take it to those teams and hopefully pick up as many points along the way as we can but really it's about developing them as people um and so they can go back into society and um be the best people they can be and as coaches that's our job too so yeah it's um it's very, you know, very rewarding when you see that and you see some of the girls that have, have challenges and they battle through those and they come out the other side. And, yeah, you know, that, that, that's what it's about. And if we, if we have a bit of football success along the way, then you know, that's even better. And I imagine a really nice part of the role as well is sort of spotting potential and, and developing the players and thinking well, they could go on to a higher level. Yeah, and again, that's that's the good opportunity here. So going into the Junior Premier League, we um, we have the opportunity where uh, matches are recorded. We obviously are going to big franchises there. The, the Junior Premier League is linked to scholarships and what have you for you know stuff in the states. Um, so it just goes hand in hand, and you know it isn't for all the players. It's it's there for some of the girls that are really keen on that, and we have quite a few that are. It's great giving the girls the opportunity that if if they want to go and kick on into a bigger spotlight being in this country or abroad, then this gives them that platform to go and do that as well. And we, know we of course, wouldn't stand in anyone's way that wanted to do that. But hopefully we can keep the girls together. Hopefully we can fly the flag. And hopefully we can do the business and take them all the way. And, um, so, you know, in, in, in a few months' time, we'll see how we go. And we can reflect back on hopefully what has been a... You know, a hugely successful, but ultimately a, a positive experience. Let's switch our attention back to the men and find out what's kept Gareth Ainsworth at the club for 10 years. Listen, there's, a, there's obviously a, um, a, a proud moment for me, uh, but uh, the win the win on Saturday is, uh, is very important. And I want to I make sure that everyone's focused on that as well. Yeah, it's a combination of being very lucky, working hard and... Um, yeah, having good people around me. I think that's the, that's what's kept me in this in this position. You know, it's uh, it's it is a hard job, but it's also a brilliant job. You know, so anyone who moans and says, "Yeah, it's, it's stressful, it's hard," it's yeah, yeah, it is. But we we know that when we go into it, you can always leave if you want. So um, I'm I'm a very lucky person, and I think that um, thinking that every day has has probably helped keep me in the job because. Um, there's a lot of people who'd want to do this job and, and um, I'm the lucky one and I'm surrounded by great people. Got a brilliant, receptive bunch of boys and um, and a very patient and supportive fan base and, and, and honour base, you know, and that's really important for me. So um combination of all those things, definitely a little bit of luck at the start though because I was no way ready and uh, we, had a few, uh, we had a few nasty surprises in store in the first couple of years. I'm sure you don't get much chance to, to reflect, but perhaps for the purposes of this, you could. Um, just a bit about, you know, sort of what you've been through in terms of, you know, guiding the club so close to going out of business, to taking it to the championship, to the Cooies taking over, to, you know, having your name on a bus, all, all sorts of things that, that have happened in those 10 years. Yeah, I'm not sure guiding the club to uh, almost going out of business is a nice statement. No, sure, no, sure but I mean, <laughs> so, so taking it through that and out the other side. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was, I was trying to guide it the other way, believe me, but um, lessons learned and uh, and probably the best thing that happened to me, you know, that season um, as a manager. And I always, I always go back to that talk either and say, you know, your, your eureka moment. That's that was mine. That was the that was the moment where I thought, right, Gareth, you uh, you can either stay here and pretend, or you can you can sort this out. And uh, and that was a big moment for me. And then um, 
As you say, you know, there's been all sorts. There's, there's no highlights because they're all highlights. Every day I come in is a highlight when I when I see the boys ready to train and ready to go, you know. But um, the championship promotion was something very special, you know. And, uh, and yeah, it's, it's just, it's been absolutely littered. I think there's been one, maybe two seasons where in 10, where there's been nothing to play for at the end. I think, I think one was the first season. And, and we had one in the middle somewhere where we finished 13th and Oxford got promoted at, at their home ground when we played them in the last game of the season. Apart from that, I think there's been something on every game at the end and, and that's been, it's been absolute crackers, you know, and, and a real roller coaster. And that's why we love the game, you know, and that's why everyone comes to watch the game and that's why we're so proud of our, our 92 pyramid because teams like Wickham Wanderers can make a difference and, and we certainly have over the years. And it's a great thing for both parties, uh, both yourself and the club, that you know they've kind of stuck with you, if you like, and, and you've wanted to, to stay as well. Yeah, both ways. You know, in the early days, I don't think anyone wanted me, but the club stuck by me. And then, you know, in the latter years, there's been rumours, there's been there's been support from the board about you know if opportunities come available, but um, nothing has been perfect for me to to leave Wickham Wanderers. I'm really, really happy here, and uh, it's sometimes looking at what you've got rather than what you could have. I think not just in football, in life in general is uh, is very important. And I think I'll, I'll stick with that um, that way of looking at things. And great that you recently signed a new contract. So it's showing that there's so much more to do at the club as well. There's so much more to do here. There's, uh, every club, more to do at some than others. And this club has definitely got potential to, to, to get even bigger, get even greater and, and have even more fantastic history. Um, the championship taste was fantastic. The new owners and, and and the plans they've got going forward are, are just brilliant. And um, like I say we've got this fan base that they could have gone elsewhere. They could have gone to Arsenal or KPR or Chelsea or, or anywhere they could have gone because we're very local to London. So the fans that come to Wickham, I really, really respect because they've really supported their non-league club through the years and then their league club and they're very proud of them and there's generations coming down. It's brilliant to see a new crop of youngsters coming through, but... You know, back in the days of, of the 60s and 70s and 80s, which is where the support comes from, you know, and, and, and beyond that, they could have gone to the Premier League, and, and but they stuck with their, their local side, which I, I think is so big. And uh, that's why I'm still sticking with Blackburn Rovers. That's my local boys and uh, and they'll never, they'll never lose my support. And I, and I think it's really important that supporting your local clubs keeps them going. Um, you know, the razzmatazz of the Premier League is brilliant, but just think about your team making it there one day and uh, and that's that's what I think keeps everything alive and great the relationship that you've had with the fans and I'm sure you sort of feel the backing as well and great as you've said before to see you know more and more people with, with Wickham shirts around the town as well especially youngsters yeah yeah it, it's been brilliant you know ten, 10 years ago I think one of the big changes is that I walk around the town and nobody had a blunt an eyelid now you walk around town and, and there is a buzz and there's uh, there's people stopping you talking about the football and, and Wickham fans and Wickham shirts in the town and and that's a real proud moment for me because uh, if anything, you know, if it's affected just one person, it's been worth it. But I know it's affected a lot more than that. And Saturday will be the, you talked about the history, 135th anniversary of the first game of the club as well. That must feel, feel special for yourself and, and also the players to be playing a part in that history too. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and what a, what a, what a place to go to, to play that game, you know. Hillsborough, one of the most iconic stadiums in the country. You know, we all remember watching the FA Cup semi-finals there, and the, and 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 big games and playoffs and everything. You know, and obviously, you know the 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 tragedy that happened, and and you know it was uh, it, it's just been part of the football and history in this country, like like no other. So to go to such a stadium, you know, for Wickham Wonders to be on the same platform as a team like Sheffield Wednesday. Is uh, is just immense for for the 135th year. You know, it's uh, it's brilliant, and um, as I say, the, the the fans have just been awesome. Um, and I think there's there's a bit of respect between the two fans as well over, over the years. So that'd be nice. Uh, it'd be a nice moment. But sorry, Sheffield Wednesday fans, I'm definitely going for the win. <laughs> 